Welcome back everyone. I'm Tyler with Ligari. We manufacture and sell high quality products that can transform any existing surface. For this video, we used our Ligari stone kit that incorporates a dirty pour technique to give this kitchen counter a natural stone look. After watching this, you'll be able to do it yourself. Now let's get started. All right, I'm gonna show you guys how to mix our primer and also how to apply it. So I have pretty much all the tools, supplies you're gonna need. We got the gloves, a stir stick, our primer, a measuring cup, which we don't really need, easy to mix in, two ounces of water, a roller tray, and a three inch nap roller that's been de-shedded from rolling this on some tape to pull all the loose hairs off. So first things first, we'll put on our gloves and then we're gonna open up our part A primer and it's always good to give it a little shake just in case anything's settled in it and we will pour that into a cup or measuring container like I have it just needs to be about one quart size that way you'll have enough room in there to mix it tilt that back in case you get any uh, primer in the handle here and then we're going to take our part B Again, shake it up. This is going to be the pigmented part of the primer. And we are doing a black primer. Tilt that back, get the residue out of the handle there. Get the majority of it out and then what we're going to do so we're gonna take the two ounces because you wanna add two ounces of water to your primer kit. We're gonna dump that into the part B, the water. And then we'll give this a shake. And this will help get the leftover primer. It's a little bit thicker than a part A. And then we'll dump the rest out. And then we're just gonna mix this with a paint stick. Really easy to mix. Want to mix it for about two minutes and, and scrape the sides as you're mixing. Scrape the bottom. So we're going over epoxy surface, scuffed it up, cleaned it, but same thing, you know, the, the, these kits can go over any surface, any hard surface. Um, so yeah, so that's why it's not just bare wood. It's already been epoxied, um, but same, same techniques and applications apply no matter what, what the surface is. So we're going to take a second, soak this roller up, and then we'll just do a little strip down the middle, and then we'll cross roll that out. So I like to do the top first. If you have a backsplash, do the backsplash next and then do your front edges. That way you're not bending over the counter and hitting it, the wet edges. Now a good thing to remember, say this was a, a white countertop and we wanted to do the black primer on it or a dark counter kit, you'll probably need to coat your edges two times. Um, you want those as solid of a color of the primer as you can get it. So if you can see through some spots or it's a little, uh, it's not covering as well with one coat, let that tack up for about 20, 25 minutes and then roll another coat just on your faces. Basically any vertical surface. The tops aren't as critical because it goes on thicker. So just keep that in mind. Make sure you can get your faces, backsplash faces, any vertical surface is solid of a color as you can get, and usually two coats of primer will do that, no matter what, what color you're going over.
So the primer needs to be rolled on thin. And then if you guys aren't able to coat the epoxy over the primer within one to two hours, um, you, you, you shouldn't prime it. So if, if this primer sits longer than that, it's gonna become a really hard glossy surface and it's an epoxy based primer. So you'll either, either have to sand it or do like a denatured alcohol wipe, try to soften that up, get it sticky. So just remember that if you're not able to prime within, or if you're not able to put epoxy over the primer within a few hours, then probably wait till you can do that. So you're not coming back and happening to sand the primer or doing a denatured alcohol wipe on it. Working time with the primer is about one to two hours. Obviously you don't wanna let it crust over and sit in a bucket, but you should have no problem dipping and rolling. It's not gonna heat up in the bucket on you. All right, so the, the island's done. Edges look good. I'm just checking for any thick edges from rolling my faces or any spots that are dripping. Maybe it got put on too thick, but it looks really, really good. So we'll start on the other tops. Now, if you have spots you can't get with the roller, you can use a cheap paintbrush to maybe get in some of the corners. Another thing, sometimes when you're doing primer over Formica, solid sealed surfaces, anything like that, um, that you weren't able to scuff up or sand, sometimes you can get separation from the primer. It looks almost like fish eyes, um, or the primer will just kind of separate, and you can see the countertop surface before, that the surface that was there before. Let the primer tack up a little, and then just roll over those spots. It'll, it'll become sticky, um, and then it won't separate like that. So. Usually it's like silicone residue or just stuff that's kind of on the counter that wasn't taken up. It's really simple, just let it tack up a little, roll over that spot and then it'll cover it. All right, so decorative edges, like we did with the Bondo, we showed you guys that. Priming that's basically the same process. There's really nothing different. You just wanna make sure it's really clean. And then we'll just apply the primer just like everything else. And you can see how much primer's left. We send extra primer, just in case you do have to do two coats. If you're covering a, a lighter surface with a darker primer, and this is a uh, 50 square foot of countertop. So one primer kit will do 50 square feet. You can see you might have to work that in a little bit more on these decorative edges. Once you're done priming all your tops, you can prime the inside edge and even underneath where your sink is. Um, and that'll create a nice barrier between, uh, keep it from getting water damage, stuff like that. 
So we like to roll the primer on this edge and then also underneath. And just be cautious. You can see how it's leaving thick edges up here. We want to roll those out, feather that in. Then all we'll have to do once the, the primer dries, uh, we'll tape this off, create a barrier, because um, we've got to tape all these edges for the dirty pour anyways. Plastic this off, just in case we get some runs, we're not getting it in our sink uh, cabinet area. All right, so primer's down. You want to give it about 45 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on temperatures. You can already tell this is already drying out where we started. Um, if I get a fan on here, right, we don't want to create dust, but if I get a fan, blow some air, it's going to dry even faster. So uh, just keep that in mind. And again, you're just wanting it to get to that dry look. You can tell where it's still wet, kind of has that milky look. Touch it, it's not pulling up on your gloves, right? A little wet here still, but once that goes tacky and you're not getting residue on your gloves, you're ready to coat. So we'll let this set up for a little bit and then we'll start uh, taping the edges and then get right into the dirty pour. All right, so the next step is taping off our edges to create a barrier so the resin doesn't flow over because dirty pours go on a lot thicker. So as you can see, primer's dry. It's still tacky, but it's not pulling anything up. Perfect time to tape. So what we want to do, we want to make sure we're taping high enough. Usually do about half half the width. Okay, because if we tape, if the tape's only a little bit higher than the counter and the resin gets to the top of the tape, it's probably gonna fold it over and gonna start running. So by making sure we're high enough, it'll never flow over. And since we are taping on our uh, faces, you want to make sure before you prime that your faces and edges are nice and clean. All right, there's our first strip. Now we're going to run it one more time. We want two rows of tape to get a little more uh, stiffness out of it. And we want to try to get about the same height with our second strip. What we'll do is we really want to press these into the surface. Get a good, nice, tight seal. Last thing we want is the resin to be leaking out in spots and messing up the design on the top. So take the time, really push it down good. And the primer will continue to dry underneath this tape, so you're not going to affect the, the primer at all. And then the last thing, you can crease your corners in just a little bit. Create a little bit more tension on those corners just by pinching them a little bit. All right, so island done. We obviously need to do that anywhere we're coating. Next thing I'm gonna show you is plasticking off where your sink was so we're not dripping in case you know usually your cutouts for your sink are pretty jagged they're not very square because um, they don't show once the sinks and so a lot of times you'll get runs or drips through your tape in here so we're going to take plastic and we're going to cover inside here in case it does drip through the tape it's not getting in our cabinet
you have a gap here, see how that won't push in? We want to tear that. Get that to push all the way in there. Get that pushed in good. Even if you have to retape. When you guys are taping, make sure you're using the yellow painter's tape. Um, you don't want to use blue tape, really anything else. You can use Gorilla tape, but we always like to start at least one. The first uh, tape that we put down is the yellow painter's tape. Just remember that it gives you the best seal um, and minimizes a lot of leaks through the tape. All right, last one. So we did the decorative edge here with the Bondo. So a little bit more complicated taping. We want to really try to push it in all into this texture. All right, guys, that's how you tape off prior to the dirty pour. Um, Tim's going to show you guys how to separate and mix all your colors, and then I'll, I'll apply it, and we'll go from there. Getting ready to mix the dirty pour. I want to show you everything you need in preparation to get ready to mix the dirty pour countertop kit. So you're going to need a five-gallon bucket, of course, the three gallons of the countertop mix that came with your dirty pour kit, you're going to want to get uh, one of the drill paddles, probably a long one and a short one. We have a five gallon uh, stir stick, three standard size paint sticks, and then we actually have 11 of the five quart mixing containers. 11 of the five quart mixing containers. We have a two, a two quart mixing container. You can use a two and a half quart and a standard one quart. So 11 one gallon mixing containers, a two quart mixing container, and a one quart mixing container. So we're going to have five colors. All of these kits have five colors. So we mix up an extra batch of just clear to flood the counters with. So the first thing we want to do is we're going to just take one of these clear four quart containers and we'll take the other ten and we'll just set them out of the way for now. I'm just going to use the two smallest containers right now. We just need to make up a small batch of clear resin so that we can float these countertops first. We need about 64 ounces. So I'm going to take one of my part A's and my part B. I'm going to pour this up to 42 ounces, my part A, in the larger container. So now I have my 42 ounces of part A, and I'm going to mix up half of that, which is 21 ounces of my part B. I'm going to get it in its own container. 
The reason why I'm pouring these into separate containers is because they don't have a mixing container that has those exact amounts on it. So I like to know that I'm mixing the exact amount of resin that I need. So I have 42 ounces and 21 ounces of B. So the first thing I'm going to do is pour my B into my A. Now, you can definitely use a larger container than this two quart container. The two and a half quart containers are probably even more convenient than the two quart. They give you a little bit extra room up top. I'm gonna turn my drill on low and just slowly mix this. What I'm doing is I'm just moving up and down the container with the drill slowly, just making sure it's mixed thoroughly. I'm trying to scrape the bottoms a little bit, the sides, and don't be too nervous about how well you mix this. We're just gonna mix it for a couple minutes, then we'll dump it into a brand new container to really make sure it's mixed properly. Once we've mixed that for a couple minutes, now I'm going to pour all of this resin into a brand new container. The reason why we do that is because we want to ensure that there's no soft spots on the countertop. And we also want to make sure that we use all of the resin out of the container. So the only way to do that is to mix it rather well and then dump it out into another container and mix a little bit more. So now we have our clear mixed up and ready to be put on all the counters. So we'll mix this out and then we'll set out uh, the material for the rest of the kits. All right, so we immediately want to pour all the resin out. Um, I'm going to show you a few options how to spread it, but before I do that, I'm going to show you how to pour it. So this obviously needs to cover all your counters. So we'll start out with a bead down the middle everywhere. And I don't want to pour it all out. I want to be able to go back and add to some spots tilting that back so I'm not dripping as I'm crossing over counters. Okay, notice how the bead levels out a little. So we wanna to try to keep an, an even width everywhere. It gets a little skinny here, so I'll add a little here, maybe a little bit here. So now we're going to go back and kind of even these out. And take note that the island's a lot wider than the actual countertop over here. So I'm not going to want to do the same amount of bead on these other counters that, that aren't as wide. So this one needs to be a little bit bigger of a bead. Now since we added, mixed the epoxy, put it in another bucket, mix it again, we can set this upside down, let all of it drip out, and we're not going to have any soft spots from it not getting mixed thoroughly or having too much resin, resin or too much hardener. So now we're just going to spread this out, basically slicking off the whole surface with a thin coat of the epoxy. You can do a foam roller, and I'll kind of show you, and, and when I do the foam roller, I'm applying pressure and kind of using it like a squeegee. Because if I just try to roll this out, it's gonna take quite a while. So by applying a little pressure, it's gonna go a lot faster.
All right, so the other option is using a squeegee first, spreading this out. Notice I'm holding it at a low angle so I'm not pulling it all the way off. It's still leaving some resin behind. So I like to just go real quick, kind of get everything spread out. And then the other option, if you don't have a squeegee, is just using a paint stick. And same thing, just up and down. Again, all we're trying to do is just spread the bead of epoxy out quickly, and then we can roll it. And then we'll just take the, the foam roller and we'll kind of roll it to even it out. So it goes a little bit faster spreading it like that. So when you guys are about halfway through doing your, your clear flood coat, um, have whoever's doing your colors start mixing those up. That way when you're done spreading it out, you can start applying your dirty pour uh, designs right to the counters. That way this isn't setting up on your sitting there getting sticky. So I'll just finish these out with a squeegee, spreading it out real quick. And if you notice, maybe you have way too much epoxy or it's a lot thicker and uh, maybe say your island or something, you can always scrape some back in the bucket and move it somewhere where it's a lot thinner too. But this is, we got a good thin coat everywhere. We don't really have that issue here, but you might run into that. Now we have the base coat down of clear. It's on all the counters right now, so we're gonna do this quickly, but you got plenty of time. We're gonna take both of our part A's, what's left of the part A we poured out of, and our fresh part A, and we're going to put them in the five gallon bucket. And we're gonna let them drain out for a few minutes. You can always let these drain out uh, when you pour out your part A for the base coat as well. After you've had them upside down for about 30 seconds, tip them up just to make sure everything's getting out of the handle. Sometimes you can get some material stuck in the top of the handle. It's like we made a little mess here. You always want to keep a clean workspace. This is just denatured alcohol and a rag. Now we're gonna pour our part B into the part A. If you pour slowly, it usually doesn't get caught in the handle, but I'm gonna tip it up just in case. There's still quite a bit dripping out of this. When it quits streaming out and it starts just dripping, it's usually good. And what we'll do is we'll move the drill from the top down to the bottom, scraping the sides and scraping the bottom with the paddle wheel. Now we have the rest of the epoxy mixed up. That's why we don't want to take too long. 
because anytime epoxy is mixed up by itself, it can heat up. So we have five colors. All of our kits have five colors. So we're going to set out five of these one gallon containers. And what we're going to do is we're going to pour out 64 ounces into all of these containers, 64 ounces. scrape all of the epoxy out of this bucket into the last one. This one's not quite 64 ounces, but I have some extra epoxy in some of these, so we can actually even these out a little bit. If you don't have exactly 64 ounces in all of them, that's okay. We just want to kind of even them out and make sure they're pretty even. So now I have my five batches here, and I'll show you the five colors we're going to use for this kit. Now we only want three of our metallic colors. So we got bronzer and we actually have two midnight pearls and two truffles. Because it's always good to split your kits into multiple batches and we'll show you why. You've got to choose five colors. So we will only want to use three colors. So we did two of the midnight pearl and two of the truffles. And we're also going to use some spray paint. This is gloss Cambridge Stone by Rust-Oleum. Gloss Cambridge Stone is this color. So what I'm going to do is just mix up all the metallics separately in these buckets using a smaller drill and I'm going to wear a mask um, just because I don't want to breathe any of the metallic powders and this is much easier to do outside so you don't have to worry as much about it. Now I'll put my mask on in a minute. One of the tricks when you're using, if you just want to use one drill, one of the tricks to not having to change out your drill head for every color is to start at your lightest color and then mix to your darkest color so that it doesn't affect or pollute the other colors. So I'm going to start at the bronzer, I'm going to go into my truffle, and then we'll do the midnight pearl. We set out five more buckets, brand new, and we're gonna make our dirty pour kits. So what we're gonna do for this particular kit, is we're gonna add some of this spray paint to the first three, and then we're going to split our bronzer up between these two, and then we'll add the rest of the color. It would be really cool. So what we're gonna do here is just spray the side All right, so you saw I put quite a bit of paint in there. Notice I didn't hold it upside down for very long. You really want to keep it upright to make sure that the color sprays out really good. So now I'm going to take my bronzer. I'm just going to pour it between these two. You don't have to leave this bronzer upside down uh, for a really long time. You can leave it and we can use some of the colors out of it, but if you want to, definitely scrape it all out. We want as much of our epoxy on the counter as possible. That's what makes a really nice looking dirty pour kit. So now we've split up our bronzer between these two kits. Now I have my two batches of truffle and two batches of midnight pearl. So I'm going to take one of each and I'm going to pour them in here together.
And notice how it's making a little bit of a mess. That's to be expected. Dirty pour kits are a little bit of a mess to prepare, but that's why you want to do it on a piece of plastic or a separate mixing station. All right, now we'll clean up all of this stuff, and now we have our five batches for the dirty pour. All right, so obviously, guys, you can, you know, do your dirty pours however you want. We're just showing you how to pour out and get the exact look that we're doing here. Um, and I'm also going to show you an easy way to kind of map out your designs. Um, the more random shapes you do when you're doing dirty pours, the cooler look you're going to get. So instead of just pouring like big puddles out everywhere and leaving it, it's still going to look cool, but it, it always looks better when you start doing these random jagged edges, right? Half circles, just a bunch of different. Uh, designs and patterns in it as you're pouring it out. So an easy way to kind of map it out is just take a paint stick and you can kind of run this through, right? Make, make any design you want. And this will kind of help you know where to pour, stuff like that, right? Now that's gonna look really cool if we follow that shape. And then obviously you can do the same thing over here. Maybe run a, run a big one, kind of down through the middle here. Now keep in mind a lot, we, we've done them where it kind of wraps corners and stuff, but, but natural stone usually doesn't wrap around a corner unless you like specifically ask them to cut those sections out. So usually you wouldn't want to kind of bring your design around the corner and stuff like that. So notice how I kind of ran it into the wall. And then I'll maybe come up here, run that one like that, come over here. And this kind of gives me an idea of where to pour my my beads out. All right, so you can kind of see my pores, right? I don't have to follow them exactly, but if I can kind of mimic these designs, this is gonna look really, really cool. So we'll just get started. We'll start pouring out of these large ones. Obviously, the more we have in the bucket, the harder it is to pour out smaller beads, okay? So I'm gonna kind of wanna move fast right here. And I'm gonna flatten this off just so it pours out kind of flat. And I can come back and add to it, right? I don't want to just pour too much out. Since I started on that side, we're going to do a little here. And then maybe a little bit right here. And then I want to get some of this same bucket kind of all over the counter. I'm being really random with it. We don't have much in there. I can let that sit. It's not really going to heat up on us crazy fast. Um, actually, I'm going to pour a little out in these thin spots. Not a lot. When you're coming to pour into uh, beads that are already out, it's always good to start on an edge and then kind of bring that into it. Instead of just pouring in the middle and then you have a little, a little blob there that kind of just doesn't really blend in as well. So I like to start on the edges and then turn it into it. And then we'll leave the rest of that in there for later. So instead of doing the one with the bronzer in it, I'm gonna do maybe two of these without the bronzer and save the one that has a bronzer in it for the last pour. So we're gonna try to get this crazy shape right here. Now I have three of these that should be fairly similar, so I'm not as concerned about hopping it around all the countertops like we did on the one that had the bronzer in it. A 
again, a little left in the bucket. I can save that for later. That's not really going to heat up because there's not a lot on there. So we'll do the same thing on the other counters, kind of like we did there. Just kind of starting to fill it in. So you see my kind of pattern. I'm going to maybe do like a half circle or almost a U shape here to kind of split that up. Again, there's a lot of ways you can pour it out. I could keep following this pattern all the way through the counter, but I personally like to do it kind of more random, the, the more natural it looks. Now, a thing to keep in mind is, right, like I wouldn't want to pour a big pile here, right? This is really thick. It's still leveling out. This will probably fill up. So when I get to this point, I want to be more precise with my pours, do thinner spots, right? I don't have to pour as much out in some of these areas. And the other thing, we want to make sure we're pouring similar amount throughout the whole counter as well. All right, so we're on our last bucket. So again, I want to be more precise with the pours. I'm going to pour a little here. I'll pour a little in some of these really open spots and then I'm going to show you how to spread that bead, that pour out really wide and we'll be able to fill in everywhere else. Again, guys, this is going to level out and really, you know, a lot of this would fill up once it levels out. You can see how small that's already gotten. It was way out here when I was pointing that out earlier. This will probably fill up by itself. Um, so I'll just kind of start and show you. And you can always add, like say, I want to get some more spray paint in here. I can take that spray paint and we can just spray it right into our last pour if we want to get more of those effects out. So now we're going to take the cardboard and we're going to pour onto the cardboard and let it drip off and that's going to give us a wide, basically a wide pour of the dirty pour. Um, when you're doing this, you're basically trapping air in between epoxy and the dirty pour epoxy you're putting out. So we will get more, we will get bubbles where we're doing this effect. Um, so we will, we will want to spray those, but it's a really cool way to fill in spots without having to pour as much out. So you see everything kind of starting to level out now looking really good. So what I can do, I'll show you how to get a little finer, do smaller spots too. So we'll add a little more spray paint because I'm liking how that's adding that color out there. Just get a smaller piece of cardboard basically. And then we'll pour so we get kind of a, a smaller bead. So you can really start fine tuning these, these mist spots. And again, a lot of this still is gonna level out really far and would probably fill all this stuff in anyways. But it's always good to try to make sure you get color everywhere.
All right, guys, so what I'll do is take the remaining buckets I have, because you'll see, you'll be able to get a lot out of them. And I'll start again, filling in any spots that are, that are missing color. And then once you get down to really small drips, you can really fine tune your veins. So I'll just pick a, pick a pattern to follow. Usually you want to do it with something that has a hard edge. Those always look the best. Got a lot of spray paint right here. I'm just gonna kind of run, run through this a little bit, kind of chop this up. I don't like how solid it looks. So we don't have a lot of dark spots in here, so this is a good one to do some dark fracture veins. So I'll maybe fill in some spots, get the majority of this out, that way I can get some really skinny veins. Last thing we want to do, once you're happy with your top, your design, we want to get rid of any surface tension on the edges where the tape's at. So I'm just going around making sure everything is coated up to that tape. Same thing with the back edge. We want to brush all that in, kind of blend it around. And so like right here, see how there's, it's not all covered to the tape? Just going to pat that in. That way when we pull this tape, it'll flow over evenly. We won't really get a lot of like polar drag marks. But you can notice everywhere we did the squeegee technique, we have where the bubbles are, right? Everywhere we flattened that off with the cardboard, kind of created more bubbles. Um, once we spray this, those will disappear. So again, just want to make sure everything's coated up to my edges, my backsplash. There's no like divots or pits that are missing product out here before I spray it with the, the isopropyl. All right, I'm happy with it. Again, you can add as many fracture veins as you want. We still have some product in these buckets that we could use, but looks really, really good. So what we'll do now is uh, we'll spritz it with some isopropyl, giving it some, a lot more effects, dispersing effects on the surface. A lot, lot of times where the spray paints are, we'll get some of those cells. If you guys don't like that look, um, you can just take denatured alcohol or even isopropyl and just mist the surface instead of, of spritzing it, right? If you just mist it like that, That'll pop the bubbles. So I'm just doing smaller drips. A lot of these will dissipate and kind of disappear and you won't notice them as much. Except for like where the colors have blended and got thinned out or where the, the spray paint's at. All those will usually stay. You just want to make sure you hit hit everywhere. You don't have to. Again, guys, there's a lot of different techniques and looks that you can get even out of this same same dirty pour that we just did too. So.
so we took the did those crazy patterns and this is what i was talking about the more random shapes and, and pores that you do i think the cooler it looks you can even tone it down and kind of flow with every pore right you could we could have did one design and kind of did all the pores with that design throughout the counters so again a lot of different different options when you're doing the dirty pores so we have a few bubbles that are still still there which is fine again that's from us pouring off the cardboard trapping the air in between the, the, the skim layer of epoxy we did and our dirty pour. And I'll show you, we can just miss that. They should pop. Might take a second, one of them popped. There you go. Missed the surface, isopropyled it. Notice all the bubbles are gone without torching. Very cool product. So the last thing we gotta do is wait about half an hour up to two hours. It totally depends on how long this took you to pour it out, your temperatures and everything. I'm gonna show you the easiest way to know when the right time to pull is. So I'll, I'll do it right here. So the best way is to pull your tape back. See how fast that's kind of flowing over. It's close though. We probably need to wait another maybe 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Notice how it's not really going down all the way to the tape super fast and it's not dragging from the top really fast. So it's really close about the time. If you pull that tape back and it's kind of flowing really fast and pulling from the top, you need to wait a little bit longer. But the biggest thing is you don't want to wait too long to where it doesn't really want to flow. But a lot of times there's so much resin on the top, it's going to flow over the face and cover it. So I'll show you guys when we do that. And then um, once that's done, we just scrape drips and that's pretty much it. So we'll show you when we pull the tape. We're going to give it about another, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes. All right, so again, it's been about half an hour since we last talked. So I'm gonna check the tape again. So this is about perfect. It's moving very slow, right? So that's enough to cover, obviously, you know, I think this is an inch and a half edge. If you guys have thicker edges, four inch or so, something like that, you're probably gonna wanna pull it a little sooner. But since we don't have thick edges, this is about the perfect time. So we're just gonna pull the tape and it's gonna start flowing over slowly, but you'll, be, you'll see by the time we get back to this side, it'll be dripping over. We'll still wanna work this in with a paintbrush just to slick off the surface so it can flow over it better. But this is about the perfect time. So you can tell it's starting to flow over. So what we're gonna do, let that kind of drip. We'll pull the rest of the tape and then I got a paintbrush, we'll come and brush these edges in so it can flow over a little better. And this is where we had the, uh, the decorative edge. So we had some bleed marks in this because obviously it wasn't a flat surface. Turned out absolutely beautiful. So you can hear behind us where we first pulled the drips, it's already getting to the bottom. So what we wanna do is the, this is basically surface tension. So a lot of these drips will keep running down the same drip. So we wanna brush this in and help this evenly flow over the surface. So I'll take my paintbrush, dip it in some of the resin just so I'm not going on the counter dry. And then all we're going to do is brush the whole edge in. And don't worry about messing up your design because it's still going to flow over and drag that top design right down onto your faces. And you'll see too, by the time we get back to this edge, this whole edge might be coated with the top design. And we'll just continue, continue this everywhere. We just want to get rid of that surface tension. It's going to help the resin flow. Notice I'm not touching the top. We don't want to mess with the top. Just hitting the edges. So biggest thing is making sure you pull this at the right time. You don't wait too long. You can again keep pulling the tape back, checking it, making sure it's still moving and flowing. 
And even if, say, you know, you have some spots that aren't flowing over, you can get some resin out of these buckets. Get it on your brush, right? It's still usable. And you can start painting in spots to help slick it off if you're not getting enough resin flowing over. All right, let's see how this edge looks. Yeah, so look, it's already going to the bottom. It's bringing that vein down. Remember, we slicked that off, got rid of the design, and the design's already back on that front edge. The same thing over here. A lot of this has already ran down to the bottom. Again, don't worry about screwing the design up. It's still going to flow. The biggest thing is getting rid of any spots that don't have epoxy. Because if you don't have enough resin flowing over, it'll never fill those spots. So as long as we can get them coated with the epoxy, it'll flow over it really nice. Yeah, it's looking awesome. So all our edge are slicked off. You can see the design. It's already halfway down here in another 10 minutes. That'll be all the way down, bringing that vein, any pattern from the top. Nice little vein here coming down the edge. Very, very cool process. So what we do now is let this drip. It's always good to periodically check your edges. Um, and then obviously if you wanted to pull the tape to the sink, you could. Obviously if you were doing an undermount sink, you would pull this and treat it the same as your outside edge. But this is an undermount sink, so we're gonna leave this. We don't wanna just have the epoxy waste in there since it's not an undermount sink. So just keep that in mind. If you are doing undermount sinks, you just treat them just like these outside edges. So last thing that we would have to do is basically scrape our drips. And it's still a little early for that, but I'll show you how to do it. We just take paint sticks, scrapers, basically anything, and we're just gonna run this on the bottom of the counter. Now this is gonna get rid of all the drips. It's still gonna keep dripping because it's still a little early to scrape the drips, but just to show you guys kind of the process. And I always like to clean it off as I'm going around. The more you get built up on your paint stick, sometimes it'll start to build up on the edge of the counter and you're trying to eliminate that. And that's it. Um, so I'll just go over a couple things. So when you guys are spraying isopropyl uh, dispersing effects, sometimes if you have thin spots on the surface, it'll kind of separate or fisheye. And if it does that and goes all the way to the primer, just take your finger in a glove and pat around that fisheye or divot and it'll fill in with resin. Don't leave those and assume they're gonna fill in. So when I'm done doing dispersing, right? Check, spraying the counters, I like to walk around, check all the surfaces, Make sure I don't have mist spots. Make sure I don't have any dimpling or any fish eyes from doing the dispersing effects. The other thing is your edges. Always watch your edges during the, during the dry process, right? These are gonna flow for another probably half hour, 45 minutes, and I can still touch up spots, right, that, that get messed up or say it looks like a drip. Like, like for instance, this is still flowing, but you can see it kind of looks drippy, like droopy. I can take my brush and kind of just go with that pattern and feather that in and that'll get rid of those like drip look marks. So stuff like this, you can really fine tune your counters, but if you walk away and assume, you know, even though it looks good now, you might see a spot that you could have fixed before. Scraping the edges, you definitely want to do that because if you don't, you'll have to come back, sand the bottom edge and you can sand with about 100 grit, 80 grit, Again, just the bottom edges, right? If you ever sand your counters, you don't wanna go heavy grit on the counters. Um, so yeah, I'll come back and probably scrape this in half an hour, scrape the bottom drips, and then it might drip a little here and there after that. But other than that, that's pretty much it, guys. Pretty simple process. We'll pull the tape, plastic tomorrow, clean everything up, and, and show you guys the finished look.